um, this rather remarkable collection of, of panelists, uh, perhaps five of the most uh, qualified people in the country to help us answer some of the key questions about where our cities and metro areas are going to be heading over the next decade. Uh, my name is Summer Mathis. I'm editor of CityLab.com, which is the Atlantic sister website that uh, covers the most pressing issues facing today's cities and neighborhoods. It was formerly called the Atlantic Cities, but we're now CityLab.com. Um, joining me, uh, closest on my, on my left here, is, uh, is Bruce Katz, who is the founding director of the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institution, and of course, co-author with his colleague Jennifer Bradley of the Metropolitan Revolution. Uh, next to him is Mitch Landrew, mayor of the city of New Orleans. And we have Jeanette Sadik Khan, uh, formerly the commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation and now a principal at Bloomberg Associates. And we have Kasim Reed, mayor of the city of Atlanta. And finally, Jeff Speck, who's a city planner and urban designer and author of the book, Walkable City, How Downtown Can Save America One Step at a Time. Uh, please join me in welcoming the panelists and, and thank you all for joining us. So personally, I'm, I'm finding this um, framework of imagining 2024 particularly apt uh, when we're talking about the future of cities, uh, partly because uh, from my own personal experience, um, I've learned living in Washington DC for the last 10 years that 10 years is uh, just about the right unit of time to really watch a city change almost entirely. Um, DC is an extreme example, but uh, the, the residential neighborhoods, the commercial corridors of DC look oh, almost nothing like they did 10 years ago at this point. Um, so you know, that's an extreme example, but um, you know, a lot of people have been talking for the last several years about the big demographic shifts back to our urban centers, the rebirth of downtowns, at, led by millennials who are looking to live in more walkable neighborhoods and in more urban areas, but also baby boomers, uh, empty nesters, young families looking for more, more urban lifestyles. So my, my first question to the panel is, um, is what, what are those key drivers that have led to this rebirth of downtowns? And, do you see that definitely continuing over the next 10 years? And, and, and if so, how, is that, how do you see that happening? I think the lead in it is millennials. Uh, businesses are following talent. And millennials have been making a decision about the kind of lifestyle that they want. And businesses are increasingly having to chase talent. And so we can see in the number of cars that are being sold, the number of driver's license uh, that people are requesting, that young people are moving in a new direction where sustainability, the environment, walkability makes a difference. So right. a city like mine um, was at 27 on the walkability list just um, nine years ago and is now at number eight. So even in the deep south, we're recogni recognizing that if you want to be competitive, and competitive means attracting the smartest people out, You've got to move, and you've got to move quickly. Our young people are buying fewer cars. They're driving much less, fewer miles yeah, they want to uh, be than, on than any generation yeah. before them since the invention of the car almost. So. I can add a little data there. Please um, do. When I was young, I think one out of 12 19-year-olds had opted out of getting a driver's license. And now more than one out of four 19-year-olds have opted out of getting a driver's license. And that data is about four years old. Right. <laughs> The summer, I hope uh, we don't have yeah. any cards. Here, so. <laughs> uh, I'm going to the Toyota game tonight. <laughs> right. I, I would say it's a demographic transformation, shift in demographic preferences plus. I think one of the biggest trends underway today, most disruptive dynamics, is the shift to open innovations and really the, the rise of a convergence economy. I mean, we used to think of the tech economy as basically, you know, what goes on in Silicon Valley mostly around communications. And now what we're seeing in cities across the country, tech disrupting everything, healthcare, education, finance, retail, energy, government. And when you have a, a move to open innovation and where companies want to work with other companies and talented workers, and when you have this convergence economy, what it does is it puts a premium on proximity and density. Companies want to be near other companies, and what they really want to be near are advanced research institutions, medical campuses, and companies with large R&D budgets. 
And that's this mashup we're seeing now. So it's like the perfect storm of demographic preferences shifting and the whole spatial geography of innovation shifting from science parks with isolated corporate campuses back down to the downtown and the midtowns. I, I think you're also seeing cities really uh, changing with this new demographic uh, influx. And you know, you've got people moving into cities for the first time in a long time. And so you know, we're going to have a million more people in New York City in the next 25 years. And so there's a big challenge. How are we going to accommodate a million more people in New York City you know, so that 25 years from now, when we open our doors, we like what we see. And that means some fundamental changes in the way that we look at the assets of our cities. And so I think cities are looking at ways to repurpose their existing assets, you know, like their streets. You know, streets are the most common infrastructure a city has, and they've been pretty much frozen the way they've been laid out for 50 years. And you wouldn't be in business if you didn't change your basic capital asset for 50 years. And it doesn't need to take a lot of money, and it doesn't need to take decades to get it done. So you can prioritize people. You can prioritize people walking, biking, taking the train, you know, riding a bike share. Uh, and that, I think, is the new way that cities are actually bringing innovation, literally transforming, just rethinking their streets and making those changes in real time. And I think that the millennials are sparking the new economy. It's not like something that you can just ignore, like a trend, like skinny jeans or something, you know? <laughs> I mean, Mar it's Mar here. Mary Landry, are, are the streets of New Orleans changing? Are they going to look they, different in they, 10 years? They're they changing dramatically, yeah. You know, if you think back to uh, after the war, when we had the GI Bill, there were a lot of whole bunch of reasons why people decided to move out into the suburbs, and we can go through that whole story, but we don't have to. But the trend was to go out. The trend was to create uh, kind of grids that actually didn't go through the neighborhood but stop people from going through the neighborhood. The idea was to get behind gated communities. The, the idea was to be disparate. That has changed dramatically. We could argue a lot about what changed it, but there's no doubt that it's changing. And what's happening is uh, Kasim, Mayor Bloomberg, uh, we're having to adapt to the change if we want to survive. Millennials, of course, um, are, are driving some of that change, but it's just not millennials. There's another thing that's mm -hmm. happening. You have older couples who have empty nests and their kids are gone, and they want to move back into the cities too. They want to move back into places that are authentic, that are rich, that are walkable, that have cultural offerings. They want to go to some place that is safe. And of course, you write about this a lot, and I think it's true. Cities have become in the nation's laboratories for innovation and change. We're flexible, we're entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. we can move on a dime. Now, it's not easy. She led the way um, at the request of Mayor Bloomberg of really kind of talking about, look, you can put bikes next to cars, in difficult areas. In my city, when they say, look, we can't make a bike lane on a commercial corridor, I said, well, look, go to, go to where the World Trade Center used to sit in New York, where the Goldman Sachs building is, where people in New York are just rushing past each other. Their bike lane's there now. And if they can do it there, you can do it anywhere. What people are asking us to do now is to reconnect the city so they can get from one park to the next. And of course, downtown is becoming a place where we're putting more residential buildings than we had before. And of course, that is following a lot of the economic development we see in our city. But what we're doing in New Orleans is really happening all over America in almost every city. And the trends are really clear. And we either have to respond because we kind of compete against each other in a friendly way, um, or are we going to get left behind? Did you have something? So, so we, have some, we have some rising populations in city centers. We've got. Um, We've got streets are changing. The physical look of our cities are going to be changing over the next 10 years. If you want to see a good example of that, you could look at what some streets now look like in, in New York City, in, in DC. Um, but, but I'm curious, I, I want to hear more about this idea, Jeanette, that you mentioned about so, some of the key ways that city governments themselves are going to need to leverage all of these new people and the resources that they're bringing into the city over the next decade in order to you know, make sure that we don't have another decline. You know, we, we, saw, we saw cities empty out starting out in the, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, and we don't have to go through that whole history, but, but how, are, how are city governments going to be trying to capture this new energy and, and keep it going? Well, I think cities uh, in the 21st century have been largely left alone by the federal government. I think Bruce said, we're home alone. Um, and we just don't have the resources that we used to have. Um, the federal funding is going away, state funding is going away, you know, and cities are the front line of delivering services. We don't really have the choice to say, mm, no, we're not going to pick up the garbage. 
or no, we're not going to deal with congestion or aging infrastructure or, or any of the issues that are commonly faced by cities around the world. So we have to really look at uh, our assets differently, and they're really hidden in plain sight. We just have looked at them with a very outdated view. So in New York, under Mayor Bloomberg's leadership, he developed this Plan YC initiative to say, you know, from a sustainability perspective, we want to reduce greenhouse gases, but we want to improve the quality of life in neighborhoods and in business districts so that people, you know, like to be here, that it improves the safety, attractiveness, the livability of the city. And that's an important economic development strategy. And it had really profound implications for New York City streets. So we really looked at our streets as not moving cars as fast as possible from point A to point B. What we did is look at them as places of incredible social and economic exchange. And people and companies can move anywhere these days in the global economy, anywhere. So really, the, the livability of your city is an economic development strategy at its core. So we work to provide choices for people, choices to get around by bike, built 400 miles of on-street bike lanes in, in six years. We built 60 plazas all around the city. We launched the nation's largest bike share program. We, they took 10 million rides just in the first year alone. And so bus rapid transit, all these kinds of options that don't take a long time to deliver and are not really expensive. Uh, and we just really don't have the uh, ability to do anything but that. Um, we absolutely have to make these kinds of investments going forward. You know, I mean, everybody looks at development as like a big brand new bridge or highway or subway system, but there are lots of things, and those are important long-term strategies, but in the short term, within this next 10 years, we really need to design our cities differently uh, and really paint uh, the cities that we want to see. Jeff, is that what you're seeing in, in as far as yeah, demand I, from cities? I was just going to add that, I mean, it's, you know, the cities where I work, they, they have like all cities, they have capital expenditures that are planned. They're going to be repaving streets. They're going to be restriping the streets, but they often just don't have that template in place. And it doesn't necessarily mean any greater expenditure to do it uh, according to a different model. Uh, it's a political decision, and that's why I'm glad the mayors are here, because you know the cities that I work in are mostly the mid-sized cities, the, the Des Moines or a Cedar Rapids or a Grand Rapids, where um, the leadership understands, for example, that a more multimodal, that's the planner term, uh, that a multimodal uh, transportation system makes more sense. Uh, generally, the city council supports it. And when you have meetings, you get a sense that the general population, for example, wants to see more bike lanes. But there is a perception among the leaders that the general population doesn't want to see more bike lanes. And for example, in, in Des Moines, um, you know, they do non-scientific polling, which is when they <laughs> When they stripe a bike lane, they see who complains. <laughs> and the, the, the experience I've seen in any city is that whenever you make a change, and that could be a good change or a bad change, whenever you make a change, there will be more complaints than support because happy people don't, don't talk much, right? <laughs> so you, you, I'm, I'm advocating that a lot of the, the cities that I work in, that they actually do scientific polling, like you were you know, Winnipeg or something and trying to figure out who's going to be elected president in a, in a technically accurate way. And I think if you were to do, if you were to do polling accurately, you'd find a, a, a whole lot more support in these smaller cities, in these second and third tier cities for the sort of progressive uh, changes that Jeanette had such luck with in New York City and we're seeing in Washington and Atlanta's doing. Um, and I know New Orleans is talking about tearing down a highway. That's very encouraging. Yeah, we're talking about a lot of that. I, listen, this is, let's be specific about this. This is what this means. There's, in most cities, there's a finite amount of space from curb to curb. Right. Sometimes in our cities, you've got more space. You can, you can build whatever you want. But in most cities, you, you're kind of stuck with something that's finite. So we're doing this right now on a street called Barone Street in New Orleans. They want us to put a bike lane so that we can move from one side of the city to the next. For those of you all that know New Orleans, from the French Quarter all the way uptown. If you want to put a bike lane there, you have to take that space from someplace. There are two places to take it from, from the parking lanes, or you can take it from the, where, the, where the cars are. And so the fight right now with businesses who may not understand this is they think, well, gosh, if you take my parking lanes away, I'm going to have less business. You guys would argue, well, no, actually, you're not. If you, make, if you put bikers on it, what that means is there's going to be more density, more people are going to be driving. There's a debate about that. So we say, well, look, leave, leave the parking lanes there. Take the two driving lanes away and just have one driving lane. Well, here's a question to all of you that are going home at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and you're tired. How much longer is it going to take me to get through that red light to get up on the interstate so that I can get home? They say 40 to 60 seconds. Everybody else says, I don't know if they're going to buy in that. 
that's kind of the fight that goes on. And at the end of the day, I think it's probably different from every community depending on where you are. Um, we've added a huge number of bike lanes uh, in the city, but there are some streets that when you get to, you know, it gets to be complicated. New York really has kind of blown through all of that and said it doesn't really matter. We know what we want to do. Wherever the complications are, we can work it out. And it's, it's really important to have a bunch of those things. That fight's kind of taking place all over the country. We're very pro bike lane in the city of New Orleans. We really kind of laid it down as fast as we can, but it's not without you know, it's conflict and it's reservations from some I folks. just want to add one thing. We didn't just like lay it all down like that. <laughs> <laughs> didn't go like that. Oh, you you mean there, like no, you no, just, no, no. Jeanette, you are you saying there was some pushback? <laughs> <laughs> just like, you said it and it happened. And Czar yeah, and Bloomberg you know. laid it out like that. <laughs> 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 Bloomberg didn't do it. But you know, I just want to add one thing. Every one of these was uh, community sourced. And the thing that is important to understand is, you know, you, uh, you look at the design of a street and you, you know, tailor it to meet the needs. But importantly, and this is really important, and it goes to your point, Jeff, that when we did the polling at the end, there was lots of controversy, you know, put this one bike lane down, and a paper said this was the most controversial strip of asphalt outside of the Gaza Strip. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bike lane. It's a bike lane. So, you know, you get people going a little crazy. But, you know, at the end of the day, when you polled people, the people were in front of the press and the people were in front of the politicians. Right. And they supported bike share by 73%, plazas by 72%, even bike lanes by 64%. So people get it. They know that their cities need to change and they're hungry for it. And they say we're not involved in foreign relations. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, no, I, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, so <laughs> Brooklyn and Manhattan is a foreign relation. So, uh, so, uh, but the, so when, when we think about cities in 2024, I, I think what we need to be thinking about, and this gets to who's going to drive this, deliver it, finance it, new energy sources, uh, really high-speed connectivity, obviously the walkability, the livability, this open innovation economy with startups and spin-offs coming out of our major advanced research institutions. The one thing about cities, and this is unlike our national government and unlike state governments, they're networks, they're not governments. And when you're a network of corporate, civic, philanthropic, university, environmental labor, government, you don't get hijacked by partisanship. I mean, you wake up every morning thinking, how do I make this place better? You know, and how do I put place over party? So I think the next city, with, and the next 10 years is going to be accelerated, is really going to be delivered by a group of stakeholders, um, both leaders and citizens, right? Grass tops and grassroots. The mayors are going to be central to this because they're going to be the ones convening these disparate stakeholders to drive the city forward. And the financing more and more is going to be off the balance sheets of some of these large institutions, um, whether they're philanthropic or nonprofit or, or corporate. So I'm going to go a little bit further. I, I say all the time that cities are where hope meets the street. The change that I see that isn't really being picked up fast enough is that subnational go sub governments or cities and mayors are going to be at the center of action because the business community is tired of the dysfunction of the federal government. So what business leaders are doing, business leaders are making a judgment that when they're talking to metros, they're dealing with 75% of the country's GDP. And they're making a decision that they can come to Atlanta, the chairman of Coca-Cola can make a decision with me, and it takes me and eight members of city council to move an initiative and he moved 2,000 IT jobs into the heart of the city. Porsche Cars North America came to the city of Atlanta. Who would ever imagine that Porsche Cars North America would move their um, national headquarters or U.S. headquarters to Atlanta? They moved $100 million headquarters to Atlanta. And if you talk to these folks, Pulte Group's home and their CEO, they said that we came to Atlanta because we were able to do a deal with you and the government and once we made an agreement, it was honored and things moved. And so what I don't think that people in Washington are getting, certainly as they defund cities, where we don't need them because they don't have a checkbook anymore, so their influence is going to decline with their checkbook size. And so business leaders are going to cause a radical change. And this isn't just going on in America. This is around the world. Business people around the world are frustrated with national governments. When you have a local leader who has the ability and, more importantly, the will to put it on the line and move, that's going to cause the real disruption between now, 
now in 2024, 84 million more people are coming into our metros, whether we like it or not. And so what's going to happen is, is cities and the private sector are going to have more and more public-private partnerships, or three Ps, or whatever you want to call them, and we're going to go right around states, and we're going to go right around Washington. That's the real story that we need Bruce, to catch up Bruce, on. Bruce, I have a feeling you agree <laughs> with Mayor Reed. <laughs> um, look, the federal government has left the building, and occasionally, <laughs> you know, you just see them running down the block, and they're not coming back. Um, but here, here's the issue. This is not cyclical. This is structural. Ten years from now, and it's great to have 2024 as the frame, they will spend at the federal level $1.5 trillion more a year on Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. We all knew it was coming. The country is aging, just like Europe, Japan, China. When they do that, they're going to scale back and crowd out a whole bunch of other investments, as the mayor is really saying in infrastructure, in education, in skills, and housing. Our federal government is essentially becoming a health insurance company with an army. And that means, <laughs> you know, that, that means everything else that up. matters in this country is going to be designed, delivered, financed by the cities and their metropolitan areas in these public-private partnerships. Are, are, are states playing no role in this, or are you well, really on your own in New Orleans? Uh, well, I, I think cities feel like they're on their own. I'll just give you one, I'll give you one metric as it relates to, uh, to crime and police protection on the streets of the city. In 1996, when President Clinton was in office uh, and the vice president was then a senator, they created a cops program because we needed to have community policing throughout the country. It cost $4 billion. Uh, Atlanta got money. We got money. I think we got 6 or $7 million a year. We hired police officers. We were both in the business of policing the streets of America because it was a national issue and there was a partnership. That funding alone has gone down by 88%. When then you add to that what you talked about, whether it's in health care or whether it's in whatever it is, the federal government basically has said, look, what governs locally governs best. Don't bother us. Um, we're not doing the kind of stuff that we did before. And, oh, by the way, when Ronald Reagan came in office, he said, we're not dealing directly with the cities anyway, we're direct dealing directly with the states. And so what's been happening with the cities is we have been left to innovate. Um, the pressure is gone on. All the responsibility is heading to the ground, and the financial responsibility is also heading to the ground, and the, and the authority and the, respons the, the responsibility to tax is heading to the ground, but the authority is staying with the state and the local governments. What that means is there's going to be a squeeze. And so what we're having to do to survive and to compete and to get better is we're having to innovate, which is great uh, in, in many ways. In New Orleans, as, as Kasim said earlier, when we have a success, generally um, what ha the, the, the elements of that success are a partnership in some form or fashion with the federal government playing a little part, the state playing a part, the city playing a bigger part, and then not-for-profits, faith-based community, business community, everybody putting all in because we can move fast. And that's just the model that's delivering today. Now, the long-term challenge is that if the federal government does not get back into the game, you are going to see some stratification between cities that have and cities that don't have, and the infrastructure in the country is going to continue to deteriorate and we're going to be weaker. Mm -hmm. And we're not, we're not really having that conversation that we should be having right now. So that's a challenge coming forward. But I think that you're going to see much more innovation. And I don't know if you all heard Kasim directly, but what he said was, and I'll, I'll borrow something from what Mayor Bloomberg said, listen, because I'm a mayor doesn't mean that I can't go across the sea right, and talk about economic development and try to get foreign direct investment into my city, that means asking another country to invest in America. They're not worrying over there about whether they're talking to the federal government. They just want business. And so mayors, we can't declare war and we can't sign treaties, right? But we can do a lot of other stuff. And I think mayors are starting to kind of branch out and actually make that happen and, and be the leaders for economic development and a bunch of other stuff in the country. You touched a little bit there on stratification, and before we get to audience questions, I, I did want to raise one, one last point. Um, in some of the, the big success stories, I would say, in, in U.S. cities over the last 10 years, um, like New York, like mm -hmm. San Francisco, like, like D.C., what we're seeing now is a, is a wave of these cities are becoming unaffordable. There's, there's huge yeah. issues uh, to do with inequality and neighborhoods and, and people being pushed out of, of places that they used to live. So I wanted to, to ask everyone gathered here for a few thoughts about whether or not, as, as other cities fall into this pattern, if, if, if they're going to succeed, 
are they doomed to repeat those those same patterns? Are 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 are, are, are cities like Atlanta or Seattle or Philadelphia next in line to become the next unaffordable great cities, but almost too great? My sense is the answer is no, because um, leaders are being smart enough to watch the affordability issues related to London, San Francisco, and New York. And if you're a mayor and you're sane, you'll look at those affordability issues right now and start hedging, uh, certainly before we completely get through the Great Recession. So in Atlanta, we have been acquiring significant amounts of real estate, a 488-acre military base. Um, the Braves uh, asked me for 150 million to 200 million bucks. I told them, um, good luck in Cobb County, and I'll be down the road to see you. But we now have, uh, we now have 77 acres that Georgia State University is acquiring. All of these are really just hedges. They're major real estate positions in the city of Atlanta where we will be able to go to the private sector and encourage them to come in to develop dealing with the affordability issue. The other part that I think is gonna help us get through this, we talked a lot about millennials. I opened my conversation with millennials. But I say in Atlanta, middle-aged people and old people are pretty cool too. <laughs> and so, so what's happening is you have a lot of people who have been highly successful who are choosing to move back into the cities. Mm -hmm. And guess what? They're pretty darn smart. And so if you'll open your door and you'll listen, you will find an amazing amount of goodwill, help, and wealth. And so that's another thing that I think people are missing. People want to be nearer to their children. And as people mature, they're getting cooler. And so, <laughs> so when, you, when, you, when you've been doing something big and important all of your life, I find that these people want to continue to do what? Something big and important. And when you're in a city and all you got to do is call the mayor and the city council, and you can get something going, you know, I tell young people, if you don't want to spend your whole life trying to change the world, you need to move to a city. The same is true for seniors. So I think those two issues, one, mature citizens are loving cities, getting involved and playing a role. Cities are hot and they're cool, which is why you're going to see more and more talented people running for mayors around America. And I think Mayor Michael Bloomberg started it. I don't think it's a mistake that a person who's worth 20 a billion or whatever he's worth, on, depending on the stock market, <laughs> chose to be mayor for 12 years. I don't think it's a mistake that Mitch chose to be mayor. I don't think it's a mistake um, that Rahm Emanuel decided not to be the White House chief of staff and decided to come to cities. So let's be optimistic. You know, I just, there's a, you know, there's a lot of negative stuff about the federal government put, pulling out. I think that that frees us up to do our own deal and to be creative, you know? I want to add a little, um, not being a politician, I'm not as naturally optimistic <laughs> as Mayor Reed. Um, but I, I'm surprised to be seeing in many of these, you know, these mid-size and smaller cities, you know, not the exceptions that you all hear about, but these cities in which most Americans live, that um, cost of, of providing the housing that everyone wants in their downtowns uh, is, is becoming prohibitive very quickly. Yeah. It's happening and um, there are certain things you can do and certain things you can't do, but it, it costs, you know, it costs a dollar and a quarter or more to build downtown what you could build out in a greenfield in the, you know, in the yeah. beltway, uh, you know, at the same time. Uh, and there's all these rules on the books that, for example, parking minimums, um, apartment size minimums. I'm working in Sarasota where you can only provide luxury apartments in the downtown. Developers want to provide these micro units, but they can't. Fortunately, that's changing. Um, banks won't lend money to developers to build housing without one or 1.5 or two cars per unit, and we have to get around that. Sometimes you get around it by fighting the banks. Um, sometimes you get around it. In, this, in the city of Lowell, Massachusetts, they actually assigned parking spaces in municipal parking garages that were empty all night because they were downtown, you know, workplace parking garages. And they wrote letters for the developers who brought those letters to the bank and said, here's my, here's my parking requirement right here. And then, of course, you know, some cities have inclusionary zoning rules that, that require developers to provide mixed use and others don't. Um, 
so there's a lot that we can do that I think the smaller cities are catching up on figuring out. But I do see the biggest challenge in terms of the proper mix of uses in our downtowns, which are key to walkability, is that housing component. Um, I think you're seeing a lot of major cities really focus on affordable housing and changing the rules of the land use game so that you're prioritizing uh, investments that are near transit and transit stations. And so the idea that you're going to have more choice, make it easier to get around, really important when you've got an aging country, right? We've got an aging demographic, and they are cool, I agree. It's a cool aging demographic. But the bottom line is, is that really people are looking for choices. And the, the tragedy is, is that a lot of the design guidance that comes from the federal government is 50 years old and it doesn't work. And so you really have to throw that playbook out. And we really worked very hard to try to change that at the local level. Even in something like transportation, you know, really the design is, is to build interstate systems. It, they're not designed for developing the streets of a city. And so all the major cities came together, big and small, and designed a new playbook. And the NACDO design playbook, which you are a part of and you are a part of. And basically what it is is designing streets that meet the needs of cities. And that includes how we tie to land use, how we tie to housing, how we make investment decisions. Because otherwise, you know, the answer from the federal government uh, and the state government it was always no. You can't do that. It's not in the book. It's not in the book. And so what we're seeing is a new permission slip for cities to innovate. And I think that's extraordinarily important in, over in the Virginia next Virginia trees years. are in Virginia trees are called FHOs, fixed and hazardous objects. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this might sound like a Brookings answer. So just uh, uh, da, da, da. there's really two elements to this, and I think we're talking about one. We're talking about we have to talk about wages, and we have to talk about prices. Right, the price of housing, the income people earn. Um, here's the challenge we have. We have 107 million people in this country who live in poverty or near poverty. In 2000, we had 81 million. Think about that. One decade, increase of over 30 million people living in poverty and near poverty. Okay, that's really where we have the worst housing needs in our country, and most of those people live in our major cities and metropolitan areas. If you have a wage problem, what you have to do is change your growth model, right? You have to basically unleash and super your STEM economy, science, technology, actually your STEAM economy, science, technology, arts, engineering, and math. That's what mayors are now doing. I, I think we're really seeing a shift in this country from an economy characterized by consumption and debt to an economy that goes back to basics. We need to make things again. We need to invent things again. We need to have more protection against the wind. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we, we, where will we continue this if it blows over? <laughs> but I, I think what we're seeing really in cities, when the national government is just mired in partisan rancor, is they're inventing the next growth model. They're basically saying, we need to be productive, we need to be innovative, we need to make things again, and then we'll have people with the skills coming out of our community colleges at our high schools who actually get paid decent wages with decent benefits. And if I might, I just think that, it's, first of all, cities, Detroit's struggling with how to shrink. It, that brings its own challenges. And cities that are now growing are having problems with growth. Uh, folks in my city said, you know, I wanted to rebuild the streets. Well, we're rebuilding so many streets. Now they're complaining that the traffic is a little bit tougher than they want it to be. That's a, that's a good problem, you know, to have. In this instance, I think what you've heard us all say is the trend is inclusiveness. The trend is connectivity. The trend is also diversity racial diversity, right, economic diversity, those kinds of things. And so what we're being pressured to do is to change our rules, to change our regulations, to change our zonings, to meet with what the demand is going to be. One of the reasons you're having this, this kind of dust up with, you know, things are getting too, too expensive for me is because two people can't occupy the same space. And so it, it's kind of kicking up against each other. I noticed, as Kasim would say, I noticed the dust up they had in San Francisco. From the younger folks that lived in the city to the folks that, that work at Google and who's occupying what space and what. I noticed that in New York with the new zoning, that in Harlem and Brooklyn, the issue of gentrification came up again. You know, so this issue is starting to percolate all over the place, and all of us kind of watch because we learn from each other and we're good partners. How are we going to deal with that issue? The answer is we're going to deal with it in a way that, that promotes inclusion, that promotes diversity. And so when we have developments, for example, that, that, the, that the government helps finance through, through uh, HUD, 
and through that, we, we actually kind of push into those things, demands that they be mixed use, mixed developments, and make sure that there's a diverse group of people that live there. It, there's, no, there's no one size fits all answer. It's trying to get the policy to adhere to the objective because the objective is the thing that produces the growth model. Right. That's the thing that's gonna make the cities more livable uh, and, 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 and be a good place for people to come. I think that's a good point to kick it over to the audience. Um, if you have a question, you can raise your hand and we'll have a microphone brought over to you up, up front here. Hi, my question is for Mayor Mitch. I'm wondering, what return do you expect your investment in at-risk youth to have on the future of New Orleans? Well, let me just say it this way. If a city, if people in a city cannot feel safe, and be safe, uh, then they can't be free, generally. Free to walk around, free to go to work, free to really have the quality of life that Kasim talked about. And so if we can find in America, and I'll talk about this a little bit later this afternoon, a way to deal with uh, crime, murder, violence on the streets of America, if we can do that, it's gonna unleash uh, just an unbelievable potential for cities. And I think that that's why it's so important that we get there, not just because it's a moral issue, not just because those kids deserve better, it's an economic piece uh, to making cities livable as well. And I just think it's something we, we in the country have not focused a lot on, so I get a little bit less happy that the federal government left me. I think the federal government has a role uh, in, in helping educate children and helping uh, with things that we need. When they cut the cops funding by 88%, that didn't help me make a child's life safe on the corner of New Orleans, it made him more at risk because they took police officers away who, who we were helping pay for by the way, for community policing. Um, I think on this education issue that we're all going through, I think early childhood education, all of that stuff is important. And I don't think we spend enough time really dealing with our kids. There were some folks in here talking earlier, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, about early childhood education, brain development from zero to three, really focusing on the human capital of making sure that our kids are safe and secure. That, is, that has exponential potential uh, for the United States of America. And here's the thing, if you don't do it, Bruce just gave you a number that ought to scare you uh, about how many people are, are really in duress. In some cities that are strong, and, and they're much bigger than New Orleans and stronger, Atlanta is, Chicago is, New York is, you have a situation where if 90% of the people are doing great and 10% of the people are doing bad, you shouldn't ignore them, but if you did, maybe 90 can carry 10, maybe 80 can carry 20. When you start getting 70, carry 30, et cetera, and that kind of, you know, it, it starts to get really, really hard. Everybody's got to be pulling in the same direction. Of course, they have to have the tools to do it. And so as I hear this, this debate that we have going on overseas about don't ever leave anybody behind, you know, that's a pretty good theory, but it ought not just apply in the military. It ought to apply on the homeland too. And I think that we have a long way to go as it relates to that particular issue. Question over here. Hi, I, I have two questions. One is about minimum wage and the other is about Uber. Minimum wage, City of Seattle just decided to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. I'm curious, 10 years from now, if you think any cities, many, none will follow suit, how that will play out. And two is Uber is coming into conflict with existing taxi, taxi yes. regulatory regimes in all many cities around the country. I'm curious how you think that will be resolved in 10 years. Um, I, I think that uh, regarding the minimum wage, um, the first thing you do is got to get your own house in order. So as mayor of Atlanta, I went in and changed on my own and made sure we started paying every full-time employee more than $10 an hour. So that would allow me to lead the conversation. I'm in an extremely conservative southern state. Um, if I were to move a minimum wage bill, which I believe I will before the end of my term, the state would then act to nullify that movement. So this has to be something that we take on both at the state level, but I think in, 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 the, in the leading cities, they're gonna move on minimum wage uh, because they don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is do something about what you control. And so that's why I made the decision to move unilaterally to do that in Atlanta because I think that's a force multiplier and causes other, other leading cities across the country to follow suit. Regarding Uber and the taxi cab industry, I think they're gonna fight a 15 round fight and I think that Uber's gonna win and the taxi cab industry is gonna have to change and, and get more flexible. But in the interim, they're gonna flat out fight it out and mayors are gonna be in the middle of it um, because 
the taxi cab industry was so old and stayed and never had real competition, and now it's being uh, forced uh, to innovate. Uber has a real challenge, though. Uber has to maintain the level of quality that made Uber the brand that it is today. And I think that at this point in the, in the life cycle of that business and that space, they haven't had time to go out there and do five years and seven years and eight years and see is your Uber experience uh, the same. Because I had one the other day that was uh, pretty close to a cab. So <laughs> they're going to they gonna have to, uh, to fight that out. I know that I'm going to get a mean letter, Uber. I love you. Um, but it was pretty tough. So that's what I think. I want to. I want to. I really want to almost ditto exactly, it's Walter. I'm glad you walked you in. They, they, uh, I want to ditto what he said on minimum wage. Uh, I, I'm, I'm hearing from from Mayor Reed that, that Georgia and Louisiana are very much like state governments can can preempt you from doing stuff. And certainly on the minimum wage, we don't have the authority as mayor of the city to raise a minimum wage in the city, but we can raise minimum wage as it relates to our own employees. I've done the same thing that the mayor has done. And I'm also in favor of raising the minimum wage on the state level. And if people are not interested in state rights and they think the federal government, I'm interested in them doing it on the federal level too. It's a good idea. In my opinion, I think they should do it. We're having the battle with Uber right now in the city of New Orleans as, as we speak. Our city council um, is being the host of the battle between the taxi cab industry. I think at the end of the day, Uber is going to win. I think that that technology model is superior. I think that political skills need some work. Uh, if, I, if I might. Um, but I think, I think at the end of the day, there will be some resolution that is going to be more in favor of Uber than not. Although it does take a little bit of time. As Mayor Reed announced this, you worked on this in New York, transforming a regulatory scheme that has been in place for however many years, where people have used in our, in our city CPNCs to build generational wealth, is not as easy as just coming in and asking the mayor to change it and having them, as I said, with Mayor Bloomberg lay it down. It actually is going to be a 15-round fight. Um, and it's going to take some time to work out, hopefully sooner rather than later. But that debate will be held. One of the issues, as Kasim said, that we want to do, we want to make sure that people are riding in safe spaces. We told the cab industry, you got to have cars that are not older than the national average, I think, is three years. We kind of kind of kicked it up a little bit in New Orleans and allowed it to be seven. But told them, your cabs have to be clean, you know, and you got to work it. But it is a it is a forceful fight. And our city council is full of people on Uber side and people on the cab side. And it's a battle that I think is going to play itself out over the near future. I'm telling you, Uber's I, worth more than Sony, but cab drivers can take you out. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to <laughs> you get in the cab. They say, boy, that mayor, he is sorry. You know, you come to visit Atlanta. They say, boy, that mayor Reed is sorry as the day is long. Let me tell you how sorry he is while I drive you to your hotel. <laughs> and, they don't hurt your city. And, uh, and I want you to avoid that, that crime is out. This guy might knock you out. I mean, it could get really, really we've, we've just not as easy as it looks. The, po the real power of the taxi cab industry Absolutely. is in talking yeah, about say, you uh, behind your back. Well, yeah. not, the taxi cab industry is powerful in lots of ways. Ooh. I mean, lots of ways. Of course. I mean, anybody that tries to make change in a city runs up against that. Ooh. I think that, you know, they don't like bike lanes. They don't like bus lanes. They don't like plazas, they don't like yeah. Uber, yeah. they don't, you know, you name it, they don't like it. In fact, I think if anybody knew who I was, a cabbie, I'd be <laughs> dead. Be be <laughs> but, but I do think, I do think that that shared economy is here to stay. That train Absolutely. has left the station. It is happening. Yeah. Yeah. And you take a look now, Uber, Lyft, Zipcar, uh, you've got two million people that are using this right now today. You know, this is here. It's in like, I forget, something like 34, uh, 34 cities or 34 countries and you've got like Airbnb out there now, you know, that's in like 165,000 cities. I mean, it's here. I mean, you basically, it's only limited by, you know, the infrastructure that you have, the housing stock and having an internet connection. I mean, that's the new global economy. That's the new global innovation that's happening. And it's going to continue to happen over the next 10 years well, as we re-look at what assets we have in place and reimagine them uh, in a world where people want to get around differently. People don't want to own a car. Yeah. It actually changes the entire car ownership model. It really flips it on its Those head. Those are actually, as Bruce said earlier, two examples, Airbnb and Uber, of 
disrupting. Total it's a complete and total yeah. dis disruption. It's moving stuff around in dramatic ways. We live in a representative democracy. There are city councils that you have to go through, people that you have to talk to, folks that you have to educate, people that you have to take things away from, people that you're giving things to. That process takes, takes a bit uh, of time, but it is absolutely disrupting and changing dramatically. And the market at the end of the day and the demand of the customer is going to drive what we get to. How we get there and how fast we get there will, will be different from city to city and fight to fight, but the battles join. You can go on, 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 on the tube right now and, and go to London and see the fight. You saw it in New York. You can see it in New Orleans. You can see it in Atlanta. You can see it in San Francisco, wherever. And uh, it, it'll be joined, and, and it's going to take a little while to get but out. But like any new technology, there's, of course, growing pains in the whole sure. sharing economy. My, my wife pulled her car to the curb the other afternoon, and some dude with a briefcase tried to get in. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're not my ride. <laughs> We're working out the kinks. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> There's a, a question right here in the in the middle. <laughs> How are you going to deal with the pension problem? Who take it on? Oh, yep. I did pensions. Um, in Atlanta, when I got elected, I only got elected by 714 votes. We had a 1.5 billion dollar underfunded pension. I know. Uh, I've talked to the folks uh, at Bruce's shop at Brookings about it. Um, we changed the retirement age. We increased the contribution from our employees from 8% to 13%. We did that in three months. We did nine other changes that um, freed up $27 million a year in operating cash for the city of Atlanta and is now taking our pension system from 51% funded, which is, as you know, is, was abysmal. And now we're moving towards the appropriate levels where we need to be. Because of the pension reform we passed, um, we pat, we balanced five budgets, no property tax increases, record amounts of cash, ratings upgrade. And so I'm a mayor that survived it so that other mayors can point and say, that guy, mm -hmm. Kasim, survived it in Atlanta and I got reelected with 84%. So turn right into it because it's 200 billion in underfunded pensions out there right now. It's a trillion at the state level and it's putting our country in jeopardy. And I got elected with labor support. And so when I decided to do pension reform, my labor friends uh, came into my office and said that if you put a bill on the floor, we're going to find somebody else uh, to, to be mayor. And I wanted to be mayor since I was 13, so I cared, <laughs> I cared about that. Um, but what I realized when I did the math was that if you're a broke mayor, and your pension costs are crowding out other services, the rest of the folk will kick you out. And so um, what I tried to do is just to, to implement. I don't think that there's any reform that you can compare in America to what we did in the city of Atlanta in 12 months. And the vote that we passed was 15-0 with the support of the labor unions, uh, all unanimous. Now, here's the funny part of the story. The labor unions, now that the city is in the black, record ca cash, right, doing well, the labor unions have now come back to sue me to undo the pension benefits while they're asking for 5% raises. So it just, it just falls into the category of if you did something for somebody, forget about it, because they did. <laughs> uh, so. I would say, first of all, Mayor, Mayor Reed really led this effort on behalf of mayors across the country. It's a fight that has got to be fought and it's a fight that we have got to win. And it's just another example how, how what's happening on the local level does not fit with everybody's predetermined notion of what's going on in Washington, D.C. Democrats, labor, Republicans, business. Across America, Republican mayors, Democratic mayors are talking about the need for pension reform. We're doing it in New Orleans right now. I'm in a massive knockdown drag out fight with my firefighters union, which, by the way, is regulated by the state, strangely enough. So the state legislature has appointed people to a pension board, some of whom are not even from New Orleans, who can make pension decisions, I mean investment decisions, if they make a bad one and, for, and perhaps maybe lose like 60% on the investment they made, the taxpayers in New Orleans have to pick up the bill. That's kind of crazy. And this it, it is unsustainable across the country. You see Detroit going through this right now. The governor of Detroit and, and the mayor and Kevin Orr have convicted what they call a grand bargain. It's really a good one. It kind of follows the same model. You can't retire as soon. You got to put in a little bit more. You got to work a little bit harder. And it's got to be sustainable. George Will said, 
un, not sustainable means that it can't keep going like that. That's what that, that's what that means. That's what, that's what unsustainable means, right? It's gonna stop. It's gonna fall off the cliff. It'll crash. That's, that's exactly what's gonna happen here, which is why we have got to win this fight. There's gotta be another bargain with public employees. You know, a long time ago, back in the day, when we weren't paying public employees a lot of money, the, the kind of deal and the covenant was, we won't pay you a lot now, we'll catch you on the back end, right? But what happened was the private sector changed, the public sector changed, we started paying more on the front end, the private sector started making money, and we kept adding on to the back end, you know, with a whole bunch of stuff that people weren't counting because it wasn't costing them at that moment money, but nobody was asking, what's it going to cost the future? And these are their unfunded accrued liabilities that will choke a horse that we have got to get a handle on, and those of us on a local level see it directly because when we do our budgets, the decisions that he and I make, if you write that check, first check out for however much money for the firefighters pension fund, you can't open a playground. You can't open a rec center. You hire can't the cut the grass. You can't hire the police officer. It's a one-to-one. -one. We don't have theoretical discussions as mayors, like whatever. I mean, our discussions are like, what's gonna happen tomorrow on the ground? And guess what? You know where the person lives who you cut and they're gonna come knock on your door. That's how, that's how our life works and it happens in real time. And there's no getting away from the consequence of your decision because you're ultimately responsible for everything happens in the city. As my daddy told me, baby, you own every pothole. And, and you're responsible for it, right? Another question over here? Uh, two things, autonomous vehicles. So at a billion dollars a mile, we're not gonna build the Paris subway in any city and it's unlikely we'll get the Bordeaux light rail. So if you've got autonomous vehicles moving along kind of like a train, you get more than one person in a car, you get them from internal combustion to electric or something, could we have a virtual mass transit system? Uh, secondly, I was really interested in all this cooperation between cities. Why not go beyond C40, which is around the environment, to create not a United Nations, not an old style bureaucracy, but a United Cities? There's an initiative now to create a global parliament of mayors. What do you guys think about that? All right, well, uh, yeah. Bruce, you want to take the global parliament of mayors? Yeah, I, well, look, I'll take I, the I, I, I think um, the world's evolving as a network of trading cities, right? We're going back to the Hanseatic League, essentially. We're going back to the Silk Road. Cities trade with each other because they have cultural affinity, cluster alignment. I mean, literally, Chicago and Mexico City have struck a trade deal together. And we've got dozens of Mexican companies coming up to Chicago and dozens of Chicago companies going down to Mexico City. This is the new reality, right? Um, cities trade with each other. They learn from each other, as everyone's talked about. And ultimately, they're going to act collectively with these multilateral institutions because they don't really operate. So when the cities come together and begin to force change, national governments, supranational governments, the EU, World Bank, et cetera. I, you know, whether you have a parliament, uh, you listen to these guys, these guys get stuff done, right? So they don't legislate, they don't regulate in the same way our national government does or state governments. There, there is some of that at the local level, but the premium is placed on problem solving. And so I think new institutions are gonna evolve domestically and globally that basically help leverage the assets of what are the engines of our economy and the centers of trade and investment. I'm not sure they're gonna look like the older institutions. I'm not sure they're gonna be deliberative bodies. I think they're gonna be action-oriented, pragmatic, problem-solving institutions. But, you know, national governments, at the end of the day, legislatures, in theory, they do represent their districts. States, in theory, do represent their districts. I, I, I think we're really talking about a fundamental remake in federalism here about who drives what. 10 more years of this, 10 more years of this kind of affirmative, positive energy emanating up from the ground, I think states and the national government are gonna have to change. And then the, the other question was about uh, autonomous vehicles and how they're yeah, gonna definitely. factor into public transportation I may be a bit on the edge system. here on this discussion. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I, think, I think having autonomous vehicles is better than not having autonomous vehicles. I think, you know, in the same way that Zipcar has taken a ton of cars off of the streets in America and, and allowed a lot of people to not own the car, and since once you own a car, the smart decision economically is to drive it all the time, then the fewer people that own cars, the better off we are. But I think it being hailed as this complete revolution in mobility 
uh, to me, it strikes me as, as the right answer to the wrong question. I think Google is being much less innovative with vehicles than they were with computers. And they ask the question, how can we make the car better, instead of saying, how can we get around better? Um, and when you still have this atomic unit, uh, which is principally driving individuals around the city, uh, in a way that makes the entire landscape equal, right? Because that's what automobility, what automobility did to our, our nation uh, when we switched from trains and trolleys and buses to, to cars, is it made the whole landscape equivalent and caused sprawl. And as long as, the, as long as the automobile and the individual unit of transportation is the basis for mobility, we're not going to be bringing, bringing ourselves together in those dense, productive ways that we've learned that economists are telling us, and frankly, that the epidemiologists are telling us are healthier, and the environmentalists are telling us are necessary for our sustainability, for us keeping on going the way we're going, um, that it's, it's, it'd be much more effective to look at how we could use this technology, as other folks are doing, to uh, enable smarter transit and smarter uh, ways to, to link land use and transportation back together again. Jeanette? I, I think there's some uh, interesting opportunities when it comes to highway, major, major highway routes, but I don't think it's uh, a great solution for uh, cities uh, because as, as Jeff pointed out, you know, you're trying to create affordable, easy options that are safe for people uh, that I think don't necessarily depend on a car. You know, a car is one of the most inefficient uh, assets that you have. It sits 95% of the time unused on a street or a parking lot. And so, you know, we're looking for ways to better improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of our assets, which is why I think that the car share piece is such an interesting one. But there is a tremendous amount of carnage on uh, the streets of our nation. 300,000 people die every year, and it's going up and up in terms of uh, uh, problems in terms of the national uh, health crisis. So we have to do a better job of designing vehicles that are safer. Uh, and I think there's some interesting work that, that can continue along that vein. What, the what about the, the marriage? Because you mentioned Google and autonomous cars, but they've also invested very heavily in Uber. Yeah. And, and as far as that being able to hail a ride uh, from an autonomous vehicle, you know, what, do you think that would help reduce car ownership as well? I think it'll reduce car ownership, and that's good. But I mean, the Google car is just a taxi with a driver out of work, as far as I'm concerned. All right, one last question. Go back a little bit to um, the Let's get the microphone here for you. So, I go back a little bit to the uh, technology disrupting cities, and just how, how focused are you at all on uh, retail internet sales, how they're kind of eating into local sales and the absence of sales tax on those impacting your revenues uh, and your local real estate? We're focused on it, but we're getting uh, punched in the mouth by states and the federal government. <laughs> yeah. If we had the ability to appropriately address the sales tax revenue loss, mayors would do it in a heartbeat because we have to see people and we have to fund a government that is increasingly taking on responsibilities that states and the federal government used to have. But um, right now, states block it because they lack political will, and the federal government doesn't address it. And I'm not, I'm not talking about choosing going wide left or wide right. I'm just saying find the center solutions that, under, that, uh, that highlights the fact that we have to fund government in a reasonable way, not being anti-business at all. But right now, uh, the no-tax crowd is totally winning and dominating. And if there were a group of mayors addressing that issue, mayors would call it because we're closer to the people, but we're being prohibited from doing that by states and by the federal government that shrinks from the challenge, which they repeatedly do again and again and again. You know, these folks need to put a, a sign up on the wall that says doing hard things is hard. <laughs> and if you didn't want these jobs, you shouldn't have ran for them. So that's what I think. So, I don't know if I'll be getting any more federal I, grants no, no, or anything. I think you get what the common theme is here, right? I, so we, we have a federal republic rooted in the 18th century that got remade after the Great Depression. We're now in a different century. The federal government should do what cities can't do. States should do what cities can't do. And then the rest should be basically left to really the folks who are going to be innovative and pragmatic with the broader networks. I, I think that's, we're living at a time where this is the level 
that's most aligned to disruptive change and most capable of adapting to it. I mean, if the federal government had to adapt to Uber or Airbnb, 2035 maybe, you know, <laughs> after 15 commissions and 3,000 legislative hearings, they are incapable of moving. So I, I think we need to rewrite the federalist contract. Most countries that are basically writing constitutions today, think about South Africa after apartheid, think about Colombia right after the, the violence. They're putting cities into their constitution because they realize this is the level at which you know, you're closest to the ground and, and enabled really to leverage um, your key assets and advantages. So we're just gonna do it without a constitutional convention because we know what that would lead to. <laughs> All right, I'm afraid we're running out of time. Thank you everyone for joining us and thank you to the panelists.